These fine gentlemen are researchers hailing from two of the finest research universities in the world, Northeastern and TU Darmstadt. Due to personal financial restrictions, they became interested in inexpensive smart home gear. Let's give a warm welcome to Gen Dennis Giza and Daniel Wegema. So, uh, thank you very much, and this, so this is Deni uh, Dennis, I'm Daniel, and today we will talk about uh, vacuum cleaners, and uh, to be more specific, we will talk about uh, Xiaomi vacuum cleaners. I already, <laughs> there are some fans over there. Um, we, uh, or I apologize for mispronunciation, the uh, name of the vendor, so I actually have no real idea how to pronounce it correctly. Um, so let's start with some numbers. Why uh, did we choose to um, pay more attention to Xiaomi devices? So they claim to have uh, 50 million connected devices in 2016, and they also say they made 1.9 million euros in revenue also in 2016. So these are already impressive numbers, but the most uh, or the biggest point for us was that the, the stuff is actually cheap as hell. Uh, when you compare it to, to other stuff, for example, um, other vacuum cleaners, which uh, cost uh, 1,000 euro, you can buy four uh, Xiaomi vacuum cleaners for uh, the same amount of money. And um, yeah, so we choose to look into Xiaomi stuff. And then we saw this advertisement. So they said for their vacuum cleaners, they have three different processors. So three processors. Why do they need three processes in a vacuum cleaner? And our eyes were already like this. So um, we were really interested to know what, what is going on in these vacuum cleaners. And then um, we, we took, a uh, took a step back and looked into how does the actual ecosystem look like. So um, in the middle of everything is basically your smartphone app. And uh, then you have, your, of course, your, your smart devices. For example, the vacuum cleaners or smart bulbs in the top left corner. There are also smart um, water kettles or um, other um, sensors, which are then connected via a gateway. And um, I already, uh, or this shows, um, this, this uh, arrows here are dotted, and uh, which means that during the connection phase, they um, talk directly to the smartphone. And then after they are connected, basically uh, they will have a um, direct connection to the Xiaomi cloud. And um, yeah, so there's no more um, communication via the app. They uh, talk directly to the cloud. And uh, as you can see, there are also uh, some other um, uh, techniques which uh, or protocols they use, for example, Bluetooth LE and Zigbee. Um, so this is already the end of my part, and then Dennis will show you some uh, more uh, in-depth stuff about these uh, uh, vacuum cleaners, and I will just present you this <laughs> vacuum cleaner. And um, thank you, Daniel. So um, let's to take a look at the vacuum cleaner itself. So this is again an advertisement and you see it has uh, a lot of sensors. So the most important one is like this uh, LiDAR sensor, but it also has like a lot of um, infrared sensors around the device and um, which is also very interesting, a gyroscope and accelerometer. So usually you would ask why a device need that, but it's actually very nice. Um, when we saw that it has a lot of sensors, we thought like, oh yeah, if, if we can root it, why not? And we tried a, a lot of things to root this thing. Um, one, one approach was uh, like to get some kind of hardware access to that, and the next, uh, the next one was the network-based uh, approach. So it has actually micro USB. So we thought like, oh yeah, so it's simply connect to the micro USB, what, what could possibly go wrong? Unfortunately, um, this doesn't work because they use some kind of authentication for that. So um, that wasn't possible. The next thing we tried to figure out where some serial port is um, on the like PCB. But unfortunately, we also didn't label that, so we had no idea. 
Um, next idea would be, okay, let's connect it to the, to the Wi-Fi and check like for open devices, uh, for open services like Telnet or something. Usually IoT device, um, devices love to have open Telnet ports or Telnet servers. But the thing was, well, PodScan wasn't successful, all ports are closed. And um, our last approach, the sniff network traffic, uh, was also not successful because everything is encrypted. So, yeah, that was pretty bad. Um, the next thing you usually do is you tear this whole thing down. So basically, you unscrew everything and take a look at. Oh, right. Uh, you take a look at the uh, whole device. Um, right. We were very surprised that it was very easy to to disassemble this whole thing. And um, so we think it's also well engineered in terms of you can unplug simply the, the parts without any connectors or something. So it's very nice. Um, the next thing what we see here is like the uh, PCB layout. So um, what, what you see here is the application processor, which is a quad core, which is an ARM quad core uh, with 1.5 gigahertz, I think, per core. Um, they're connected is also like 512 m megabyte of RAM. Um, it's the DF3 RAM, I rem if I remember. It has also like four gigabyte of uh, flash, and over SDIO there's some Wi-Fi module which um, connects the whole thing to the Wi-Fi. Um, for all the real-time tasks, like for example the sensors, um, there's some SDM32 MCU which takes care of everything like that, and uh, this is like ARM Cortex M3, as probably most of you will know. Um, there's also an additional um, MCU in the LiDAR, which is not shown here in this picture. So um, if you look at the back side, you see that there's a lot of test points which are labeled uh, with different marks like test point one, test point two, and everything. Um, problem with uh, that is it doesn't give us any information about if there's a UART or something. What we figured out uh, was that the only two test points which didn't have a label, they're actually the UART for the, for the application processor. But unfortunately to that, um, if you connect to that, you don't see anything, so, um, or you cannot, can't do anything. So next step, um, okay, we need to attack the hardware somehow to get root access, and our weapon of our choice was aluminum foil, actually. Um, the idea behind that is actually, um, so if you look in the data sheet of the application processor, it has some, some fallback mode, which is called FEL mode. So what we did is we um, inserted the aluminum foil under the BGA chip, and shortcutted the MMC data lines, so the, the application processor fall back in this uh, FEL mode, and then we can um, connect through USB and upload some small tool which then dumps the, uh, the complete memory uh, uh, content of the MMC flash. As soon as we had the MMC flash, we could um, do some modifications to that. We didn't have any checks, runtime checks on like, certificates or whatever, and then reflash it again to the, to the chip. Um, fun thing about that is uh, exactly one, f one layer of aluminum foil fits under the chip, two are too much, actually, so you need just one. Um, the idea is just to corrupt the, corrupt the data. As soon as we take a look into that, that vacuum, uh, image, uh, vacuum cleaner image, actually, we figured out that we use actually uh, Ubuntu 1404, which was mostly untouched in terms of the packages were still original. And we do a lot of patching on, on a really regular basis. For example, we close down the um, vulnerability for the uh, VPA um, quite, quite fast. For navigation, they use uh, open source software um, called Player, which takes care of all the sensors. And they have, of course, like also a lot of like proprietary software which do the cloud communication or like the uh, control of um, um, the commands which come from the cloud. Um, one thing which uh, we figured out is actually behind the USB, there's some ADB running, but the ADB do some custom authentication things, so you basically um, you need information which you don't usually don't have um, to access that port, and so that, that's not possible to, to get on, onto the vacuum. Um, and then tr most interesting is also like they we run SSH, but the SSH is blocked by, by IP tables, so they close down also that thing. So actually not that bad, technically. Right. Um, so let's take a quick look at the data on, on the device. Um, apparently, we love to create log files. There are a lot of log files. Um, for example, we collect uh, syslog files. We collect durations for, for um, um, cleaning jobs, uh, the area which, which we're driving around, but also like uh, important data like SSID and passwords. 
Uh, fun thing is, we're in some binaries, we have this line with DCP dump. Now the big question is why we need that. Uh, well, um, I don't know. <laughs> you can think the rest. Um, right. And um, for all of you who have like some kind of LTE with volume-based, um, you know, um, stuff, um, this, this vacuum, if, if it's just stand around, it creates a lot of data already. Um, so it's multiple megabytes per day. Uh, if you run it um, um, for cleaning, it creates even more data. So basically, um, if you have LTE, then probably you have a big interest to, you know, root this device. And um, also maps. Maps I will uh, tell later in one, one second. Um, so all this data is uploaded to the cloud, so the vendor has it. And um, another important thing is if you do a factory reset, the, um, the operation system is, uh, is um, restored from a recovery. But uh, the data, like the maps and the logs, are not deleted. So basically, we are still on a vacuum cleaner. So if you reset your vacuum cleaner, sell it on Amazon, then the next owner of the vacuum will know your SSID and password and how your apartment looks like. Um, talking about uh, apartments look like, this is how the maps look onto the device. So basically, this, this open source player software uh, creates this kind of maps. Um, technically, they are bitmaps, um, 1,024 pixels uh, in square, and one pixel is more or less equivalent to five centimeters. Um, one thing is the lighter is way more precise, but they just store like f um, five centimeters um, in terms of like accuracy. Um, right. Um, before we take a look at the com um, at the um, communication itself, we um, want to take a look at the configuration. So um, one thing which is quite usual for all of the Xiaomi devices is um, that every device has its unique device ID, which is um, burned at the factory, more or less, into the device. For the vacuum cleaner, it's a text file, so it, uh, technically you can edit it, but for other devices, it's like in UTP memory. Um, and it, they have two kinds of keys, a cloud key, which is um, just used for the cloud communication, and it's never changed, and a token, which is only used for the app communication, and it's changed every time uh, if you reset the vacuum or connect it to complete new Wi-Fi. So um, I know that there are a lot of like uh, attacks outside there who, who try to control the vacuum cleaner over this token, but every time you connect it to your new Wi-Fi, the, the token is regenerated, so you have to start from the beginning again. Right. This is just for in, a few information about that. So if you take uh, a very simple look at the uh, cloud communication, everything here in this left box is actually um, the internal of the of the vacuum cleaner, so, so you have a lot of like processes inside which take care of the navigation, and the most sensory one is the Mio client, which uh, takes care of all the communication between inside and outside. So, for oops, I have to. So here we have some examples. So if the cloud wants you to do something, uh, it sends you a message which, which is encrypted, obviously, with the cl cloud key. Then this Mio client encrypts it and forwards it in plain text, plain text JSON to, to the internal devices, which then communicate over, for example, IPC between each other. And the result of that thing is again um, forwarded inside the vacuum with uh, plain text, but then as soon as it exits the vacuum, it's encrypted again. So all the time you see something, it's encrypted. Also, if you download it like firmwares or upload map files, then it's, uh, everything is. Um, also um, encrypted with HTTPS, as you, as you see on the cloud side at the top right. OK, um, let's take a quick look at the um, update process itself. So what we do is actually, so we um, need my laser again. Um, they send from the cloud an encrypted package with the pack package information. So the, the cloud tells the vacuum where it has to download the, uh, the firmware. So we give them the URL. And the next thing they do is they give also the MD5 of the URL. So let's say something goes wrong by the download of the, of the file, then the vacuum can check, like, OK, is the MD5 OK? So you can attack that very easily. Um, the next thing that happens is um, that the vacuum wants to download it. We, we, shown here, uh, we, have, we show here the, um, some simple, simplified um, structure of the memory. So you have technically two copies of the operation system, one active copy and one passive copy. You probably know that from all uh, of the uh, IoT devices because it's quite usual for all devices that we have at least two copies of the operation system. So the vacuum downloads the, the package, then checks in the next step if the MD5 is OK, which was transmitted in an encrypted uh, channel, uh, channel um, from the cloud. 
if that's okay. It uses some secret key to decrypt this um, package, and, and it unpacks that to some temporary partition. Next thing, this is quite important, they, uh, they update the root password. So basically every device has a different root password, which you don't know, actually. Um, so not, not a master password for all of the devices. And the next thing is it, it updates the passive partition. Um, after this, this is done, um, the vacuum takes some time to rethink and reboot, and it reboots the new updated partition, and the next step, they, uh, they updated, uh, update the old active partition again. So after that, you have a completely updated uh, vacuum cleaner with the newest version. Right, so um, the thing is, well, how this firmware updates looks like, actually, and um, there are two kinds of firmware updates. One firmware update is like full and uh, the other is partial. They encrypt the tar G uh, GZ uh, archives, and most of the time they contain, uh, so the full image contains the disk image uh, which has the full um, file system uh, for the Linux. The fun thing is um, they use, they weren't very creative in the password for the encryption, which is Rock Robo. And the next fun thing is uh, you can download also sound files on the vacuum and it uses a more complex password than this one. So they protect their sound files better than the firmware updates. Um, the firmware update is encrypted with AES, with, um, which uh, Secret, which is a standard Linux tool. And the integrity is more or less protected by the cloud because the cloud tells you before that uh, what the MD5 is look like. Right, so um, now we know the password for the, for the firmware and we get, them to, uh, get this firmware somewhere. Um, we can prepare our route, and uh, this time um, we, we simply take the firmware and rebuild it. For example, we include uh, our authorized key file for SSH, so we can log in with SSH, and we remove the IP tables rule for that, so that the um, SSH is not protected by IP tables anymore. The next thing that we can do is we can send the um, update command ourselves with the URL of our own web server and the MD5 of our own file, and the good thing is that the vacuum cleaner accepted um, this command if we encrypt it with the token. So basically, the token it's, it can somehow get the token somewhere from, from the app, for example, and then um, we can send this, um, this update command. It takes a few minutes, so like I think between five and 10 minutes, and after that, what you can do is you can log in into that thing. Like I said before, it's Ubuntu, so you can do apt get update and install your own software onto that, um, and like run like um, HTOP or something. Um, the next interesting thing is um, you can also access directly the sensors. So for example, here I have some, some map data which is created by the, um, by the LiDAR sensor. Right, now we have the root access onto the de that device. Then we want to gain independence from the, cl from the cloud. Um, we have two methods actually. Um, it depends more or less if you want to still be, if you want to be still able to use the app from them. So the more drastic one is to replace simply the cloud interface, and the other one is like to, to proxy the cloud uh, communication. So um, if you want to get rid of the cloud completely, so what you can do is you simply take the uh, Mio client and install your like own client. It could be some some small Python script which do some external commands like from uh, FEM or Home Assistant. It's very easy to do that, and to get rid of the, um, of the map upload, you simply use a host file which simply kills all the Xiaomi servers. Um, very easy, but the problem is now the app doesn't work anymore. Um, but it's very simple, actually. Um, the other thing would be like the proxy, uh, the cloud communication. For that, we developed some um, open source implementation of the Xiaomi cloud, which we call Dust Cloud. <laughs> Uh, and it basically is a complete emulation. So, you, so what you can do is you can actually forward even packets to the real cloud, or you can simply um, use it like as a local cloud solution, or, or like even you know forward change commands, um, suppress them completely. Like f you want, usually you want to suppress firmware updates. Uh, that kind of stuff you don't want to you know send outside. Uh, let's set, uh, get inside. So um, this is um, some way. Um, what you can do, and we publish also this uh, thing on our GitHub. Right, some use cases. Um, you can use this whole thing as a home automation server. You can use it also as a web radio, and, or even as a, as a file server, but the file server problem is actually, so, so the usable memory is like two gigabytes, more or less. So it's not a very uh, um, big file server, but the good thing is if you have a power outage, 
this thing holds for two days with the battery, so it's a, it's a great thing. Um, I, kn I know that the question would come like, oh, can I use it for Bitcoin mining? I think nowadays it's a little bit difficult. It has two GPUs, which are used somehow, but um, I think they're very too, too slow nowadays, so oh, sorry. But if you hack millions of them, maybe. <laughs> okay, um, for the home automation server, we have some sample, sample um, firmware where we installed um, FEM into the vacuum cleaner, and you see here that we um, uh, can run it more or less uh, locally. We know the token because we can access it directly, and then you can run your home um, automation system um, directly on the vacuum cleaner. Um, no need for a Raspberry Pi. Everything runs very smoothly. Um, we have some downloadable content for you, but we are not EA, but we uh, demand money for that, so it's free. Um, we have modified some, some firmware for you, so you can download them and install that. Um, you can download also the, um, our cloud emulation. But the thing is, I'm not a very good Python programmer, so basically it's totally broken and insecure, so don't use it for productive means and don't put it on the internet, maybe. Um, I'm also very happy if someone can take a look at that. And we also will publish um, pictures, uh, pinouts, and much more. Everything under the domain donvacuum.me. Uh, yeah, so, so we upload this thing like in today in the evening or so after the talk is over and we have time. Right, um, so we had two things we want to mention. Um, actually, two words of warning, not one. Um, never leave your devices unprovisioned. So we know a lot of people, or some people, who, some professor even, um, who, l who thought like, oh, I don't trust the cloud, so I'll simply don't connect the vacuum to the, to the Wi-Fi. That might be a bad idea because they, they have an open Wi-Fi access point, the vacuum cleaners. So what c someone can do for you is like it can provision that thing for you and can install like malicious firmware or even snoop your apartment. So always provision your device. And the second thing is be very, very careful with uh, used devices. So bad people could like order that kind of devices on Amazon and send them back after they put something onto that. And um, if you do it for very, very expensive devices like some like Roomba for 1,000 euros, then um, there could be some assumption what kind of people would buy this kind of stuff. So, you know, it could be very, uh, hap yeah, never mind, <laughs> bad ideas. All right, and that's more or less the end of uh, our presentation. Um, so we want to thank um, two people more or less, or two, yeah, more people. Um, the Zemo Lab uh, at the TU Darmstadt and Professor Nobir from the um, Northeastern University. And now we are happy to take your questions uh, about our talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis and Daniel. So if you have questions for Dennis and or Daniel, please uh, line up by one of the microphones. There are four over here, one, two, three, four. There are four over there, five, six, seven, eight. And from the internet, one of our signal angels will be reading your questions aloud on your behalf. So, let's see. Any questions for the Xiaomi vacuum hacking? Signal angel, do we have a question from the internet? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, microphone number two. Test, test. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. How many robots were harmed during your research? <laughs> um, so in total I bought like nine of them. <laughs> and also worked. So, so it's just a 100% chance of like successful uh, rooting. So yeah. No, no brick ones. Yeah. Microphone number six. Uh, hi. Uh, so you said uh, what the robot is doing when I have it in my Wi-Fi, it's uh, sniffing all the traffic and uploading it uh, to the cloud? Well, hello, 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 okay. So um, there is at least a cloud command which uh, Xiaomi can, for example, send to your vacuum, which then enables monitor mode and uh, enables this TCP, sniffing, uh, TCP dump sniffing. So we don't exactly know what, why there would be some kind of uh, command like this, but we saw at least the string and we know that there is this command. We did not investigate further into this uh, up until this point. So, 
Okay. So the logs are just there, but they are not sent by default. No, so they need to send the command for this to start and, and so on. Yeah. Um, okay. But the logs are uploaded all the time. Also, so, so the logs are uploaded, but it doesn't mean that the pcap file was there. So logs are always uploaded, but the pcap file have to create uh, to have to be created by the command. Hi. Uh, have you looked at any other Xiaomi devices besides the uh, this robot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's this. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, this is sort of spoilers, but yes, we did. For example, we looked into uh, light bulbs, smart light bulbs, and we were also able to root these kind of devices. Or let's say we we were able to um, get them into your own cloud, if you uh, want to say so. And we will present this work at Recon at the beginning of February. Hmm. So your question is um, if we, so we, we have total root access to the vacuum, we can install everything. Um, and the player software is actually open source, it's also used for different kinds of, um, of other robots and it's just the, the standard uh, open source version which they also use basically to communicate with the sensors of the robot. Was this your question? Yeah, I didn't also understand it, so I'm just was curious. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you mentioned you had uh, ADP uh, D running on USB. Did you try to reverse the authentication they implemented on that uh, custom installation? Uh, yes, yeah, so we tried actually. So we figured out that you need some some uh, strings like the uh, like some kind of root password, which you usually don't have, which usually the the vendor properly has in its database. So uh, there's. They did it quite well, so the application is, is not that trivial. Actually, it's, it's even have multiple levels. So you have, to, even if you have one level, you need to, to gain another level. So it's like, uh, it's it's way easier to after you root this device it's to install your um, the open source ADB uh, software. So you can simply connect USB and do ADB shell. So if you have once you have that as a re recovery method for the for the vacuum, you can do that. But uh, to reverse the uh, the authentication. Um, of the of the ADB of the custom ADB, it's uh, way too hard actually. So it just accepts a hashed version of a password for the ADB D or uh, it's it's some kind of challenge response what we do. Okay. And if you even did the first level of the challenge response, there's a second level, ah. and I think there's even a third level if you want to get a shell or whatever. So it's like um, like a game. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, did you disclose this just to Xiaomi before? Because I just got a bug release update for my vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we didn't. Uh, and the reason is um, be because we don't want to uh, we don't want Xiaomi to close down this bug. I mean, it's not a real bug, but you know, um, the thing is, as soon as your vacuum is, is, is rooted and as soon as you have the cloud encryption key, they cannot do anything anymore because you can read all the communication, you can get all the firmware updates, you can send your own firmware updates to the vacuum. So as soon as you have the key, you you more or less protected against the firmware updates of Xiaomi. But the problem is, if uh, if you buy now a vacuum cleaner and, and they change something in the firmware that it doesn't work anymore, then um, well then we have to start from the beginning again, or you have to use aluminum foil. Uh, because against this attack, I think it's, it's very hard to, to somehow, uh, for, the, for the chip at least, what we use, it's very hard to, to defend against that. But it's not very, s uh, so, so if you have the choice to remotely update your vacuum uh, with your own firmware, please don't use the, the aluminum foil, because it, I mean, bad things can happen in terms of you miss, miss, you, you miss one pin, and then you put some five volts onto the MMC, and you know, it, if you have no idea what to do, you better don't do the aluminium foil thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the, the player software, I think the player software is supported by default. So basically, they use the player software to control the small robots to do some collaborative thing, I guess, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. So. so. Your, your root of the device, you can do anything you want. So. Yeah. Okay. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. And uh, how did you get the passwords, like Rob Robo, or how do you know that the voice packages have a better, better password? Um, well, we reverse engineered the binaries, and the fun thing was that they have still all the debug symbols in, the, in that, because they thought, uh, why well, remove the debug symbols? And it was very easy to, to get the strings. It was simply some way a string, and it was uh, in the near of the decrypt command, and there was this work robo thing. First, we, we didn't thought that it's a password, because, like, well, it was too easy. Uh, but after we had the password for the, um, uh, for the audio, audio files, uh, then we looked more, cl more deep, uh, deeper in this thing, and then we figured out that Robo is for real the password. So basically, you're engineering with the binaries itself.